Hello, everyone, and welcome back to .NET Conf. Uh, my name is Adrian Stevens. I'm my good I'm friend Jason and colleague, Gould. Jason. And uh, what are we talking about today here? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Azure today. Today we've got Azure up, and actually, well, I say today, but really we've had we've had quite a few sessions with everybody on .NET Conf today. So, so last up is our Azure discussion, and we're going to keep working with uh, some of the tools that we've worked with through all of our .NET Conf sessions. But we're going to make sure that we have uh, have things processing in the cloud and working through the cloud now at this point. Fantastic, and I've got my my slides up here. We're going to go from edge to mobile with Azure. So we're going to go all the way from our IoT devices through a, a pretty impressive Azure pipeline. Yeah, exactly. Um, Processing pipeline on the cloud. Yeah, impressive being what we can do in Azure. It's pretty amazing And stuff. then consume it from uh, from a client application. And of course, we're from Xamarin, Xamarin University. So we're going to use a Xamarin client app to, to consume some data. So you we've got, got a lot of cool things to show you, a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, let's hear a little bit about you first. Right, I guess. Let's <laughs> see yourselves. Why are we here? Uh, my name is Adrian Stevens, and I'm the curriculum manager for Xamarin University. Uh, so I work with the team that writes the curriculum, the content, the educational training materials for Xamarin University. And of course, you are on the very talented training team. That's right. I am one of the uh, trainers, the live trainers at Xamarin University. And uh, what we do is essentially exactly what Adrian and I are doing today, is we teach you guys Xamarin and Azure development in live classes it's kind of even better in a way because right now I'm mostly talking at you you have a little bit of ability to ask questions but it's not quite as interact as it interactive as if you had your own mic which is how our live classes are structured we have 20 30 40 people in a class everyone's got their own mic I tend to do most of the talking <laughs> but we have interactive sessions we get questions asked we talk to each other we solve problems together we work through building cool mobile apps cool Azure apps but if I take a class with you, I can talk to you directly. I can ask you questions. I can get help. Exactly. Fantastic. Work through the exercises. Mm -hmm. We, of course, are coding and building applications during these classes. That's really key part of that, of that experience is actually building an application, seeing it working at the end of each class. Absolutely. And we also have uh, a free component. We have our self-guided learning at Xamarin University. So you can go on and take courses absolutely free. Uh, right. Great. Completely free. Yeah. Several hours, each yeah. class, I should say, is several hours yeah. of learning material. Absolutely. So great intro content. Uh, learn how to develop Xamarin Forms applications. Use Xamarin Android, Xamarin iOS. And, and again, you're going to be building real applications. And whether you do the free training or the instructor-led training, both of those will work you towards uh, Xamarin certification. Exactly, exactly. Pretty fantastic. Uh, if you're interested, head on over to university.xamarin.com. Uh, we love Xamarin. I think you will as well. We'd certainly love to see you there. But you know what we also love? Azure. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So uh, really, the summary here is we're going to talk about a lot of cool things in Azure. Uh, and I think I might want to jump into the architecture. And, and yet, as, as, as many cool things we're <laughs> going to talk about in Azure, um, it's worth pointing out that that there's about 732,000 features in Azure. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to hit a, a, small, a small, small portion, portion of them. Of them. Yeah. Uh, we're but, definitely not hitting all of them. But what I love about this here is we're going to show you some, some great ways to use the services in Azure and give you an understanding of why we chose the ones that we did. And so to help you, this hopefully gives you a bit of insight and helps you navigate really the, the huge selection of amazing things you can do in Azure and, and make some sound decisions. Yeah, absolutely. So what are we doing? Well, uh, I, I know Jason is a big fan of IoT. Uh, I am as well. Absolutely. So anyone who watched our uh, previous session knows how excited I get about IoT. Absolutely. And so we want a way to really manage data from IoT devices and be able to, to process and consume that data on a client, on a, on a mobile client. Yeah. In fact, we have this uh, this one actually right here, this device right here, and we saw it actually going through the web, and we saw that we were actually able to completely reproduce an animation on the other side. And that implies a lot of data, right? The positioning data coming through many, many, many frames per second. Um, that kind of data, that kind of throughput, we need special handling for. Absolutely. And fortunately, Azure has a, has a great solution for us. Uh, and once we have the data in Azure, we might want some processing. You know, we need to, you know, whether we need to store it, uh, do some calculations, um, we'll look at, at a way to do that. Uh, I jumped ahead to storage. We're definitely going to store our data today. Our data has to go somewhere. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, absolutely. And then well, it can go to another visualization. But absolutely, yeah. There's there's lots of places it can go in Azure. But yeah, <laughs> but, we're going to store it. But storing it, it is still yeah. a good idea. And we're going to store it off really so we can have historical data and then expose that via a REST endpoint. Right. And then that REST endpoint we could hit with a mobile app. Absolutely. We could of course hit that with just about anything. So maybe another website. But but I think a Xamarin mobile app is a really great choice. 
Absolutely. So if you see our diagram here, we're going to focus on, on the middle four there, the upper part, so the parts that are in the cloud. But we'll talk a little bit about, about our edges as well there. Yeah, and of course, the other sessions that we did during .NET Comp, we dove deep into both of those other two sides as well. So don't be shy about checking those sessions out as well. Absolutely. And so we're going to start by sending some data, how we're going to send data really to the cloud. And to do that, we're going to use something called IoT Hub. So with that, from our architecture diagram, we're really focusing on the first part here. That's just the IoT device into Azure, into IoT Hub. So Jason, really, what is IoT Hub? Well, IoT Hub is, as I said, it's kind of built to handle that extreme throughput that we're getting from IoT devices. Um, in general, IoT devices are there to interact with the real world, as we kind of talked about in our last session. Um, sometimes that means measurement. It often means measurement, sensors, getting data real time. Right, reading the real world. Right, reading the real world, and often many, many, many times per second. That's what we need to know to be able to reconstruct yeah. the information that maybe our machine learning algorithms or business analyst uh, uh, business, uh, BI algorithms are going to interpret. Absolutely. So, and so, and for us, we've been using you know a single device as example, but it's very possible you've got IoT solutions that have dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of devices sending data. Right. Quite frankly, I mean, if if you're talking about a production application, it doesn't make much sense for me to develop a solution if I only have one device. It makes sense to develop a solution if I have hundreds of tractors right. out there exactly. or thousands Fleet of tracking, devices. Fleet tracking, I love equipment tracking. Exactly. And, and quite frankly, that's how we get to the point of, of you know using machine learning algorithms to see have that sensor data tracked and compared with the history of, say, a tractor breaking down. And we can see that based on the sensor readings we're getting from this thing, based on, say, how it's been moving or how it's been turning or, or, or something from the CO2 sensor, we think it's about to break down. Well, that's a lot of data. We need a lot of data coming in and coming in fast. So there's special tracking we need for that, for, or, or special ways right. to handle that much throughput. All right, and this is where IoT Hub comes in. So it's purpose-built. I mean, the name says a lot. It's called IoT Hub, and it's meant to interact with IoT devices, and it's designed for these exact situations. But it's also designed with security in mind as well, where a lot of times these, these small devices aren't. Right. We can't really put usernames and passwords in these things if they're if they're headless, if there's no monitor, if there's no keyboard. Right, right. they might be out in the field, they might not be manned. Right, it might not even really be a user, right? right. So it, like, as you say, it might be an unmanned device. And yet, if we're talking about a fleet solution, it's very likely that we're talking about we're a big corporation with big corporate competitors. They'd love nothing more than to poison our BI data, the data that we're right. doing business intelligence against. Right, so whether they're, they're taking our data or sending false data. So we want right, to have some, exactly. some mechanism security they'd, around that. They'd love to get false data <laughs> into our BI algorithms and machine learning algorithms. So we need some security wrapped around our device, wrapped around how we're getting our information to our cloud. And that is where IoT Hub comes in. Perfect, and exactly. So IoT Hub, high volume designed for IoT and designed with security in mind. There's lots of great features. We'll touch upon a few of them. Uh, but what I want to talk about really is sending data to IoT, uh, IoT Hub. And right. with now, of course, IoT Hub is also capable of getting data back to individual devices and, and fairly easily as well. But yeah, we're oh, focusing on sending up. Absolutely, IoT Hub, definitely two-way communication with IoT devices. But yeah, so for sending data to the cloud, we're going to use a, a class called Device Client. And this is we'll be able to install onto our mobile client devices uh, using the uh, the package, the APIs provided by the Azure team for IoT Hub. Wonderful. Yeah, we have a NuGet package that we can just download into our .NET applications. If you're not a .NET developer, then you're probably not watching us right now because this is .NET Conf. But <laughs> if you need to support a different platform, then there's a huge variety of platforms for which we have Azure client libraries available. But right. most of us are going to grab that NuGet package. Absolutely. And so we're going to use that device client uh, class. We're going to just create an instance and it really comes right down to it send a message to IoT Hub, we're going to provide the appropriate data to that device client class, and then we're going to call send event async yeah, and, and the, fire up that string message. Yeah, and the package is going to handle all the protocol negotiation, the retry stuff for us, the queuing up, yeah. failed messages, all that stuff's handled right there for us. We just say send async. Well, let's look at just a little bit of code here and see how we can do this. So I'm going to open up uh, a Visual Studio solution, and uh, I've got a solution here with a number of, uh, of devices, really. And, and by devices, I mean I've got applications meant to run on devices. And this is everything from a test console application, something meant to run on UWP IoT, or even Android things. And uh, fortunately, of course, we're dealing with C Sharp and .NET, and we love to share code. And so kind of the, the key code is actually in a shared project. So all of these applications uh, have, a, have the API installed. They've got a NuGet package installed. And again, it's really great. So it's console, it's Android, it's UWP, and we've all got 
the Windows Azure, uh, not the storage, but the Windows Azure client. They can find this. Let's just search for Azure. Yeah, just search for the exact. Yes, uh, <laughs> a lot of packages going on here. Uh, Microsoft Azure Devices Client there package. There we go. And so this is going to give us that uh, the types we need to communicate with our IoT hub. And I'm going to jump, well, let's just open up one of these first. I'll open my Android things here. And so we need a few pieces of, of information. I should maybe hide my keys, but we'll, uh, I'll, change <laughs> I'll change those later. Right. Uh, but we need uh, a few pieces of information to send this data to IoT Hub. So I think maybe we should jump over to the portal and see where we get that information and yeah, then come back to our let's, code. Let's look how we'll configure our IoT Hub in the first place and then how we can, how we can get yeah. those keys necessary to, to authenticate that device. Absolutely. So with everything in Azure, we can hop in and we can search for the thing we want to create, find IoT Hub. I mean, we can new one up, and again, it doesn't take very long. Right. Uh, usual deal, we're going to pick a, a resource group, we're going to pick a pricing tier, we can pick a location, all, all those standard things we do with Azure uh, we've mentioned before as well. Yeah, it's, it's really a little scary how easy it is to new up just about yeah. anything in Azure. New VM, magical yeah. machine in the cloud, new, uh, new network, new subnet, yeah. magical, <laughs> magical VPN <laughs> in the cloud. So like yeah. everything else, yeah. it takes about four seconds to create something incredibly complicated. So a Absolutely. And just show you, here, here it is, IoT Hub. You can new one of those up, and off you go. Yeah. Now, I'm going to open up one I've already created. So this is called Excel here. And right away in the overview, we see we have a host name. Right? This, is, this, is our, this is really our endpoint. This is, how, this is where we're going to send our data. We, our devices need to send it somewhere. Well, they can send it to our host. That's our endpoint, right. Now, of course, we mentioned security. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to show you that this is designed to manage devices. So we go down to our Device Explorer. And here we see a list of devices we've already created. And we can, of course, add more devices. I'll do through the portal. There's a number of options. Uh, we can do it programmatically. Uh, we can do it. We can script it. Right. Just yeah. like anything in Azure, yeah. we could, of course, just pull open PowerShell. And if our if our PowerShell foo is is on point and our Azure scripting foo is on point, then we'll uh, we'll be able to just script and do everything there. Um, I do tend to like to use the portal because my my PowerShell and um, Azure cli foo is not on point. <laughs> Absolutely. I love the portal. I love doing it programmatically. Right. <laughs> and again, if you're producing a lot of devices, you might use the API and provision programmatically, especially if you don't want to do it you know, be out in the field wiring these devices by yeah, hand. Right. If, if you're doing it as part of your process, yeah. if, if you know you have, to be, you have to be standing up new things as part of an ongoing process, then obviously, yeah, doing it programmatically yeah. makes a lot of sense. But being able yeah. to point and click is obviously, uh, obviously pretty easy. Yeah. And pretty fantastic here. I mean, I might as well just even save this here. So I'm put in, I put in Adrian Raspberry Pi, I'm going to hit save. I'm going to leave the default. So this is going to generate a symmetric key. Of course, I can actually input one here, but I'm going to. Uh, yeah, the other thing he could also do is choose to use public-private key authentication as well. So he could right, click with, the with X509 certificate. Yeah. And, and, and upload a certificate, exactly. So we could choose to do that as well. Yeah. But in this case, in this case, we'll stick with the, uh, with the key yeah. mechanism. And you saw it really fast, just that quick. And uh, when we look at any of these devices, so I'm going to look at one. Uh, I'll look at my Android Things device here. Notice that we jump in and we have a device ID. That's, of course, just how we name the device. And we see our, our primary and secondary keys. And these are just symmetric keys really for, for our encryption, for our communication. Right. And I'm going to grab one of these, grab and the just, key. You can think of it as our device's password. So we set up a device ID. That's the username. And the key is the password. Now, it's not a person's username and password. It's a device's username and password. But obviously, mm -hmm. then, the key should be treated privately the same way a password isn't. This does bring up kind of an interesting point, which is that key and therefore the data in your hub that you're analyzing is only as secure as this device. So um, my device isn't very secure right now. You can see anyone can walk up to it and they can access the, uh, access the memory chip. So it's not very, uh, very secure right now at all. However, obviously there are ways to handle that. But that, that's, that's a different story. But remember, yeah. your data in the cloud is only as secure as the devices that are able to send data to it. So if that key is compromised, anyone can pretend to be this device. Yeah, absolutely. We could do an entire talk on, on IoT security. So uh, for now, we're going to do this the, the more direct way. So I'm going to bring in my device ID, my key, and my, my endpoint, my, my IoT Hub URI. And this now in our source code. Perfect. And really what I'll show you here is that we're going to, uh, I'm going to call a, a send, a send a, a message. And so it's uh, send data in my shared code. And really, the main important part is over here. And let's open up my device to cloud class. So this is my shared code. I'm just jumping to the uh, interesting point. So we pass in our device ID, our device key, and our endpoint, our IoT hub. And here, we saw in the slide, device client dot create. And again, we're just passing in all of those details. And the important part here is we now have a device client object that we can use to send data. 
Now, there's a little bit of specific here about getting uh, sensor data, but what I want to show you is to send the message, all we do is use that, that object, the device client object. Exactly, just like we saw on the slide. Yeah, and call send event async, and we're sending a string. Now, there's something interesting here in that, yeah, it's just a string, but of course, there's many encoding schemes we can use to put data into right. our string. And of course, we have JSON, obviously, being a common choice yeah. because JSON is awesome. I, I mean, <laughs> JSON is awesome. I think they're both pretty awesome. <laughs> so, but absolutely, so we're going to use JSON, convert here, we're going to serialize the object uh, into a string, uh, do our encoding, create a message, and fire it off to IoT Hub. Because we defined that endpoint, the, that URI, the message is off. Excellent. Now yeah. we're done. Yeah. And we've got a little bit of authentication there. Of course, we've got the keys are matching. And, uh, and yeah, so that data is off to the cloud. And if we go back to our portal, we go to our overview for IoT Hub. Let me just, uh, here we go. Uh, we can see what messages come in. We can see that we received 900 messages today here. Uh, and, and notice again, this gives a sense of scale. Uh, this is the number of messages per day, and we're uh, on our, our low price tier. I've got my S1 standard pricing yeah, we're tier. On the very basic yeah. pricing tier. <laughs> 400,000 messages a day. So, right. again, high, high, high volume. Of course, it goes yeah. up vastly from there. Right. So, this receives data, and, and actually, there's a queue in the background. So, it will store the data, but it's really meant for you to hand off to something else in Azure so it's we can a, then do. It's a temporary you know, shelf, it's, yeah. just a, it's just a little holding tank. And so, you have what? One to seven days. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can configure, configure, configure it. So let's go back and, and do something with our data. And so that we're going to do a bit of function app programming. So we're going to use a serverless compute, a function Excellent. app. Excellent. Uh, and, and the first time function apps were explained to me was actually by you. <laughs> and and I, I said, what? <laughs> I, I, what? Wait, this doesn't make any sense. It's, it, you're just giving me magic. And I know this, this sounds like a sales pitch, but I want you guys to realize how blown away I was because he's going to write a method. He's going to have a single method. And it's going to have all of the data he needs, and he's going to have access to exactly what he needs to create the output, to, to output it, and just do it all within the single method or you know, whatever yeah. other methods he calls from it. But, but there, there's no class, there's no project, there's no, there's no server to deploy the project or class to. It's just, just write a method and ta-da. And Absolutely. Pretty blown away. All the NuGet packages that you needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have Amazing. a look. Amazing. So this part here, yeah, I, I, I love I love function app, serverless compute. Um, okay, let's talk about that. So we're going from IoT Hub. We're going to process our data, our messages, with our function app, and then we're going to put it somewhere. So we're going to put it in table storage, and, uh, and I'm going to pass it over to you for table storage. But let's talk just a little bit about function app. So I said it already. It's serverless compute. So we love cloud. We love Azure. You know, the, the most basic thing was running a virtual machine. Uh, in Azure, which is still valid today. I mean, you did it. You did it today. You ran. You've got a VM running Linux, and, and VMs are fantastic because we're not worrying about the hardware, right? We're it's less management. We're just in deploying the OS and the software. But we still worry yeah. about the OS, the software right. that's installed, the stack. Right. The we're still patching and versioning and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And so there's there's the next level of abstraction where we just run run an application platform, and we're not worried about the OS anymore. We're just worried about the executing platform, and this is this is the next level of abstraction where. We're not we're no longer just deploying a project in code. We literally just write the function that we need to do, do the work. Azure takes care about the executing platform, the runtime environment, any versioning, OSs, all that kind of stuff is abstracted away from us. We just write a function, and it just calls run and does some work for us. So it's like kind of like static void main. It's like the it's like almost yeah. like a console app, but it has access to to well, I see your event data coming in there, so. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a really good indication so here. So we've got some input data on our function app. And again, we can do some processing. And you notice that it is C sharp. So I think the best thing to do is go over the portal. But I wanted to show you a couple of core concepts first and maybe talk about table storage. Excellent. And then show you this to you in action. So a couple of cool concepts with function apps. Uh, we have something called a trigger. And so as Jason mentioned, we're not worried about all of the infrastructure around it. But by that, we don't really have anything that runs our application, right? Right. What we calls the run method? Right. I don't have a user yeah. to press a button or, or, to, right. or to hit enter on my console. So for function apps, we have a concept of a trigger. And this is something we see, we see in other parts of Azure as well. And it's really it's what you think. It's, it's that button press. It's what's going to kick off our function app. Make the function yeah. run. Now, great news for us. IoT Hub has, a, has a, an event hub style endpoint that we can connect to our function app. And the great thing is, is they're, they're really designed to connect together. So every time we receive a message in IoT Hub, we can have it trigger our function. And so run our function yeah. for that particular message. And the great thing about triggers is all the triggers pass in data. And so in that case, this, this event hub trigger is going to pass in the message we received by IoT Hub. 
exactly what we want. Excellent. But of course, there's other kinds of triggers. So you can get a scheduled trigger. Of course, you can just have it go off at a certain time, a uh, certain um, you know, period. Uh, there's, there's an HCP trigger. And, and actually, I mean, you made a really good point yesterday. This is the, kind of the catch-all, right? Right, because if, if you don't know what else to do to get your app to trigger, I mean, everything else that you have, every other integration point you have in, in Azure or anywhere else has some yeah. access to HTTP, generally speaking. Yeah. So, so I can always figure out a way to trigger my function app by just hitting that HTTP endpoint. Button. Right. I, so I it's, can it's call very general purpose. For a mobile app, any kind of client, uh, and really other parts of Azure that might not have the correct trigger wired up. Yeah. HTTP request, love it. Perfect. Uh, and then we also have what we call bindings. And bindings really just let us interact with other pieces in Azure. And, and typically, the bindings refer to storage. So uh, an important concept of, of, of serverless compute and function apps is that they're stateless. So they're going to run. You're going to pass in some data. It's going to run, run the method. It's going to do its logic. And then it's going to power down. And so two, actually, I say two important concepts. The function apps by default are only going to be alive when they're needed. When they're triggered, they power up. They do their work, then they power down again, and they're not going to retain state. So if you need to retain state, whether that's stateful within your, within your function, or you just want to save off data, right. you're going to need to connect to, well, some storage. And that's where the bindings come in. The bindings allow us to connect to other things in Azure, generally storage. and so grab can, access to some other thing yeah. in Azure. And, and then it's being passed to my run method, it appears, right? So, so my run method right. is just getting access to my table or my SQL server or, or my queue or, or whatever it is. It just gets passed in and I just use that API. Absolutely. Because it, it's passed in as a parameter. Again, because it's, we don't have state. There's not, there's not a, a class level variable. We're going to get passed in uh, in the run method as a parameter and off we go. Super cool. And so what we want to do, of course, is we're going to save our data. We want to have historical data from our IoT devices, which would make a lot of sense, especially for devices in the field. And for that, we're going to need some sort of storage. Right. What kind of storage do we use? Well, we like table storage for this. Um, and table storage may be a little bit uh, unusual to, to some people, or its its way of use may be a little bit unusual to most .NET developers. Well, and it's a little bit new, really, compared to something like, like a full relational database. Well, certainly it's new compared to that, although yeah. although the concepts behind table storage have been around for, for well over a decade. but. But yeah, it is, it is certainly newer compared to, say, relational database management systems like, like SQL Server, um, and it's used differently. So table storage is, is this idea of, of well, it's, it's a lot less expensive, which means I can store an insane amount of data relatively cheaply. It actually uses your same Azure credits along with blob storage and file storage. Compare that to the more expensive storage options like SQL Server or Redis, and you'll see that, 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 that table storage is a very, very kind of low level, just easy way to access simple data. Right, and I think what you're saying here is really important. You're saying table storage, and you're comparing it to SQL Server. Right, with SQL, we're powering up a full server, whereas table right. storage is just storage. Right, we're talking with that about, we're talking about transactions and atomicity, mm -hmm. and we're talking about a lot of things that, that go beyond just simple storage. So table storage is really meant to be very simple, and you can simplify your data by structuring it in a certain way, right? So that's the part that, that you see a lot of developers have a hard time with is, is we're going to simplify our data. We're going to flatten our data. We're going to duplicate our data a lot. Instead of having, having relational tables or callouts to another table through foreign key, we're just going to flatten that data. We're going to put all the information for a given record on that row. And then the other interesting thing about table storage is you're going to have two and exactly two indexes. They're not exactly indexes, but we'll treat them that way. And they're always called partition key and row key. Now, partition is interesting because this actually refers to physically kind of how we group our data. And the interesting thing about that is, now, now I know that, that Azure has some abstractions around, around physical storage, so, so I'm not gonna say it's actually always on the same physical hard drive, but you can almost think of that, think of it that way as if the partitions all live together on a single physical device. And then within that, the row key is the index within that partition. Okay, so with our IoT devices, what might be a good use of the partition key? Well, it really depends. The idea is just to get uniqueness between partition and row. So, so partition maybe the device and row ID. key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that would work. It really depends on, on your situation. You might use device ID 
That might be enough uniqueness for, say, a device table that only has one record per device. However, if you're getting a lot of records per device, you might need to concatenate that with more information. And this is another one of those parts that can, that can really bother a, a, a traditional relational database developer is since we only have two keys and they're always strings, it's actually considered a acceptable and correct pattern to structure your key by, by kind of mashing together multiple pieces of information. As long as you can reconstruct that in order to do an efficient filter, an efficient query later, and by the way, as long as you're only querying on partition key and row key, it is super duper fast no matter how much data you have in there because again the partitions kind of kind of break things off into a separate universe for you a separate physical location okay and i think i feel like speed is probably important here we're speed talking about a lot is, of messages from iot hub right speed at scale is, is critical what we trade off is complexity we have only a very very simple set to work with two indexes they're string based and that's all the uniqueness we get. We try to search on other things. It's very, very inefficient. If we search on any of those other columns, and we can have many other columns. In fact, often you'll see, in, because we flatten our data, you'll see hundreds of other columns. But we won't search on those. We won't try to filter on those because everything has to be read up into memory in order to, to filter on that data. So it just requires a little bit of a little bit of creativity, uh, a little bit of planning on how we use the partition key and the row key, and potentially even additional tables then to access certain types of data. If Absolutely, we need to. and I, I think the biggest thing is to just kind of break out of some preconceived mindsets that we have based on how we've used relational databases. Relational databases are still my absolute favorite way to store data. Don't right. get me wrong. Very, very they, flexible, very, right, very fast. Very robust, very flexible, very fast, and they do all of the things that I need. Can SQL Server store terabytes of data? Absolutely. Can it also provide atomic transactions? Absolutely. Can it also give me a transaction across multiple reads and multiple writes? Right? It can do all these things. But there's a cost both in terms of actual dollars right. and there's a cost in terms of, of compute trade-offs. Table storage yeah. gives us all of a, a small percentage of that. <laughs> at a small percentage of the cost. Absolutely, so it's, it's really picking the right tool for the right job, and in this case, this exactly. is a great option for us. Right, this does everything yeah. we need. Yeah, but it might not be the less. only solution. You could use an alternate table mm -hmm. store, an alternate storage mechanism that Absolutely. is better suited to your solution. Absolutely. Let's head over to the portal and, and see uh, our table storage and our, and our function app. So back to the portal, and I, I won't walk you through this every time, but again, all these things are searchable. These go into Azure, fire them up. They, most things spin up very quickly. Uh, hopefully you've created services in Azure before. I will show you for table storage. It actually comes under, I don't think the search uh, comes why up. Why don't you go ahead and make sure you duplicated or mirrored your monitor. Oh, we're not mirroring, absolutely. Let's get that going. Sometimes my device drops out there. Thank you. So mirror it, then everybody gets to see, which is probably more fun for a presentation. I mean, <laughs> Adrian could Thank just you. go ahead and do uh, his own thing. I'm glad you're watching the, uh, the monitor here. Let's get this over to duplicate. Excellent, yes. The resolution change should have been a tip off there. <laughs> Perfect. All right, back to the portal. Excellent. Thirty. Um, so table storage. If I search for this, actually comes up under storage account. And and you said something that I thought was really insightful here. That kind of little light bulb off my head here. So we see storage account has blob and file and table and queue storage. And, and why is that? Well, again, table storage is is pretty simple. It's a pretty simple yeah. structure, and so so we really just just bill for it the same way we bill for blob storage, the same way we bill for the very very simple stuff. It's basically we're we're renting you disk space when you when you use table storage, when you use blob storage, um, and you'll notice again the other services like like Hadoop and Redis and SQL yeah. Server, right? Those uh, have have different levels. They are providing mm -hmm. services. Right. on top of disk space. And right. so there's a different price structure associated so, with that. So storage is kind of the keyword here, right. table, table storage. Table storage is right. simple disk space, basically. It. It's simple storage. OK, and function app, same thing. We go in, we search function app, new it up, and off we go. So let's take a look at the function app. I think yeah, it's a lot of part, fun. I love this. Yeah, uh, I know. I'm really excited. I think this is something we'll be using quite a bit in the future. So we need a function app. And then within the function app, we host functions. Makes sense. Let me show you a function right away. Uh, I think that helps give you a little bit of insight as to what it does. So it jumps in. I've got this run.csx. And right away, we look on line six, we see our run method. And notice we hear our IoT hub message coming in. 
And then we got our, our reference to our tables coming in. So all those things we needed, we talked about in the slides. Yeah, so we're going to need to see how that happened because it looks magical it's, right now. It's magical. It's all here, yeah. No, and the great <laughs> thing is... Everything I need is right there for me. We've got some really fantastic UI to manage this. So if I go over to Integrate, here we see our triggers and our bindings, our inputs and outputs. So, and so what I want is I, I, I have this... I, I want to get some data from, from IoT Hub and I want to do some processing and then and then store it somewhere. And and I just saw that you have yeah. a function that just has the data that we need it to use and the output that yeah. we want. It's already just, just there and ready. It's pretty fantastic. So if I go to IoT Hub and we go down to our, our endpoints and click on events. And uh, this actually prints it in the event hub compatible endpoint. And all we do is define a consumer group, and this really is a label. And so I, here I've got my, uh, my function app. Again, not, not a creative name, but nice and direct. <laughs> this is my consumer group for my function app. This allows it to communicate with our IoT hub. Right, and excellent. And with this set up, and again, literally just write them in. There's not much going on here in terms of defining this. I can, I can delete it, but I can make new ones. <laughs> so it's just really my label for my connection here. Yeah, great. I'm going to go back to our function app. And I can wire up to that event hub compatible endpoint. And I just make sure I use my consumer group here. And if I scroll down, uh, there it is. My consumer group is called function app. And I wire to my event hub, my IoT hub, and off I go. And now. And so because so through your event hub interface, yeah. you basically said, I want to kick something off every yeah. time, every time we get a message here, because that was configured as yeah. part of the, the IoT hub. And then in the function app, you're saying, okay, yep, I'm the thing that you should kick off. <laughs> by, by, make, by making the trigger that points to it. And I think what's, what's important to understand here is I'm going to show you a little bit more under the hood, but really deeper under the hood, Azure, the parts of Azure are meant to communicate with each other. This is the value of using something like Azure, which has so many things. They're meant to integrate, they're designed to work together, and this is right, a great so example of this. Find a Lego yeah. piece that fits what you're yeah. trying to do. But this wasn't too random piece of the box. This is, it's, it's lots of these things are meant to connect this way, and they're standard connections, and there's lots of plumbing and wiring under the hood for us. Yeah, awesome. Pretty fantastic. Now again, we see our inputs and outputs, so if I wanted to, um, you know, restore state. I might have an input for some storage here. Okay. Uh, for us, we're just going to write data out to the output table here. So, uh, notice I have my my Azure table storage, and it's the exact same. Uh, so this is accounts. why we also had our, our tables being yeah. passed in, is because we're configuring it, saying give us these. Yeah, and you can see here, there's actually a lot of options for our output. Uh, we can actually go back to another event hub. We could see even trigger another function app. But again, we're, we're noticing event hubs, right? It's a standard a standard trigger mechanism, standard okay. communication mechanism in, in Azure. It's pretty fantastic. And we see our other storage types. We've got Q and Blob. And again, lots of fun things here. I don't want to overwhelm. I just want to show you that it, it, they've made it really easy to wire things up. And again, pretty fantastic. Now, this all does look sort of magical. I just click on some things and off it goes. But we can go to the advanced editor. And this gives us a little bit more insight of what's going on under the hood here. And this is just creating our bindings. And here we see a type, an event hub trigger. And a name, IoT Hub message. That's our name. That was the string that came in in our run method. And again, a little bit uh, defined. Here's our, our consumer group, our function app. And so all of this is defined in JSON. Azure can process this and really connect the dots for us. The exact same thing for our table outputs. Again, we have a type of table. We give it a name data table. We've got a second table that's our status table. And again, this actually, I don't, I don't go too far into it because we've got so much to cover, but this goes back to architecting our table strategy so we can ra quickly get the information we need yeah. without doing a full query, for example. So Excellent. we're just updating our status when we get a message from our, our device. And that's something that could also be done directly from IoT Hub as well. So lots going on, but if we go back now to our, our function app, notice our run method here. Now I have to no, interrupt yeah, please, you one please, more yeah. time because <laughs> all right, I've got it. You've got your your message coming in, and I and I see the tables for outputs, and yeah. you've explained that, and I got that. But the, there's one more piece of magic you're using still that that isn't being passed in. You're using NuGet, or you're using uh, JSON.NET here. Absolutely. So let's look at that code really fast, and then and then I'm gonna jump over to that because that, that's a really powerful thing, and this is because it's amazing that from yeah. this little from this little main method here, this little yeah. run method, you can access that tool. Absolutely. So we are in C Sharp, and this is a C Sharp script, a CFX file, which again means we have the power of C Sharp and .NET. So notice our run method is calling a couple of, uh, couple of functions, a couple of methods here, but update data table, update status table. Now remember, we, we encoded, we did some JSON encoding of our, our data back on the client side. Now we have a JSON encoded string message coming in. So we're going to pull it apart using JSON.NET. 
And here we see on line 18 our J object, and we're parsing and pulling out our, our acceleration data. And um, so, of course, JSON.NET we know is deployed as a NuGet package. So if I go over to view files here, notice we have a project.json. This should be familiar to a lot of .NET developers. It's just like what I do have right. in my SLNs, my solutions. Absolutely, right? We wire up our dependencies. And in this case, we define a dependency for Newtonsoft JSON, and I happen to pick version 6. Um, of course, we give update the latest version. And so when we run my function app, it yep. goes to the internet, pulls down the NuGet package, and uses that to run the code that I've written in my function app. Absolutely. So when the trigger, when the function gets triggered, the function spins up, it pulls in the dependencies, and runs your code. Now, presumably under the hood, I don't know all the magic that the Azure team pulls out. There's probably some caching involved. Um, but it's worth keeping in mind that our function has to be brought up, and so adding a lot of dependencies may impact performance. All right, but still, this yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, so you guys thought I was using some hyperbole. If you haven't seen yeah. function apps before, yeah. then you've got to be as amazed as yeah. I was. This, this stuff is okay. crazy. Like it, we don't even have a project. Yeah. We're not publishing yeah. it with its NuGet packages or anything like that. We're just writing some code right in the portal. It's executable. You told me it doesn't even have to be C sharp. No, absolutely great point. So and I can run multiple functions in my function app, and I'll just show you quickly here languages. Bash, batch, C sharp, F sharp, JavaScript, PHP. Pick the tool that you are familiar with, that you know best, or that's best suited to the task at hand. Right, we can chain these together. So if I have some heavy duty math processing, maybe I will write some Python in a function app because that's great for doing some heavy duty math. And then I'll chain that to a C-sharp script because that's maybe what I'm more familiar with. Absolutely. Because I, mean, I and called someone else and asked them to write the Python script <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> no, I wrote this the first time in JavaScript to see if it work. And I said, that, that's great. Awesome. Now I'm going back to C-sharp because that's where my comfort zone is. And, and there's a lot of templates here as well. They're quick starts. And they'll, they've got kind some of, wiring here as well to set up the bindings and triggers. I am kind of curious as to why you would choose to voluntarily do JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> so excellent. So again, now quickly, let's go back to our slides. Let's get this moving. There's so much cool stuff to cover here. So going back to our architecture and jump right into it. So at this point now, IoT device sends the data to IoT Hub, function app is triggered. And we we did this pretty quickly, but actually there's some code in there in the function app that's writing to our table store using those passed in values. Right, we've got it passed yeah. in, so it actually it's pretty it's pretty trivial to just actually write that then yeah. to a table. And so now We've got it in table storage. We want to expose it via a REST endpoint. Just make a web app. Right. And so we're on, we're on the second half here of our, of our project. And our web app, well, hey, we're C Sharp developers. What are we going to host? ASP.NET in an Azure web app, yes. Absolutely. And so, of course, this, this ASP.NET web app is going to be pulling in the data from table storage and then exposing a REST API. We won't go through all the details of our ASP.NET project because I think a lot of you have seen this before, and I think there's some other really great talks today, we too. Actually, we actually yeah. saw some amazing yeah. .NET Conf talks around ASP.NET, so you guys should definitely check yeah. those out. Um, but yeah, we won't hit that one too, too heavily, but it's pretty good stuff. Um, and I do see we have, uh, not exactly, well, we have one question from, uh, <laughs> from, 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 from D. Yardy, who I, uh, who I know from my Xamarin University classes. So hello, David. Good to, good to see you on there. I'm assuming, if, if that's some other D and not David, then I apologize. But I'm assuming that's David from Xamarin University classes. And uh, you can't have one of these shirts because it's for employees only. <laughs> And, yeah, and I'm not sure these, these exist anymore. I they think these actually are, don't. They're, yeah. they're, for, they're for employees who were employees yeah. two years ago, yeah. actually. <laughs> and, and Funky Onyx <laughs> noticed that we've given them six hours. So you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're having a great time. And we are. This is fantastic. Yeah, Thanks, we're, guys. we're having a ton of fun with this. So uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just had to acknowledge yeah. those guys. And cheers. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, exactly. Do you want to show the, the mobile app a little bit there, the, the yeah, ASP let's, let's, what app? Let's give them a quick look. You've got it open. Perfect. And, uh, so We've got again, some, some other interesting things that, that actually do go on with that, yeah. besides just the REST endpoint hitting table storage, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I'll just show you very quickly. I'm going to show our, our, uh, our controller. And it's just an API controller. And so again, to expose the REST endpoints. And, and, and a little bit simplistic here, but we've got a connection string to our table storage. Uh, and again, a lot of this is automated for us, right, in the Visual Studio tooling. Uh, we catch our Azure account, we sign in, and we can get the connection strings. It'll actually add it to our solution for us automatically. Again, Visual Studio, ASP.NET, they're all built to work right. with Azure. All this stuff right. is, right. It's, it's all Lego pieces that fit together yeah. that have the, the Lego interface. Therefore, yeah. they all plug together doing their own and things. I think and I can dig into my web. We can write a little code inside, inside of our Legos. 
<laughs> and you can see here we've got some some of the keys are defined here. I won't go through all the details of it, but uh, but they're all they're all nestled away in there. And, and of course we have what I want to show you is we have our, our REST endpoints, right? We've got our our, our get methods here and such. <clears throat> and so now, um, and we can query per device, and we can query over time, and we can hit this endpoint. And so we saw earlier, Jason, on the presentation, we're sending data from my IoT device. Now I've got, of course, a, I mean, no surprises here, we've got a Xamarin Forms uh, cross-platform application that can consume this data. Should we fire it up? Yeah, please, let's. All right, so this is a startup project. I can do it in UEP just for uh, the deployment performance. Uh, but of course, it does work on iOS and Android. Sounds like a great plan to me. We'll give fires up, it fires up faster just for our, for our demos because we're running from from the IDE, so it fires up faster. But in act terms of actual performance of your apps, your apps will perform just as well on all the platforms. Oh, absolutely. And so here, right away, we see we've got some some devices. And so this is actually this is actually querying our REST API. It is. So and 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 I will warn you that if you hit Jason's Raspi three, it's going to take a long time to load all the data because we've been standing here for for two right, full so yeah. presentations uploading data. Yeah. I think <laughs> my 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 call right now, I think, is over time, not over number of, of uh, data points. So oh, I think good. It's, it's a little bit piggy, right? So um, let's do uh, one of the other devices, one of our test devices, our Android Things device. Excellent. Um, and so hopefully, it's just going to query the REST endpoint and pull in some data. Do, 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 yeah, we'll give this a moment. Get a little Jeopardy, Jeopardy music. I, I am actually spamming the endpoint. We are on the uh, with with my device right here, the one that you guys see sitting between us on the table here, is actually right. currently uh, uploading data and has been. Oh, good, good. For okay. the entire duration of our last few sessions, so so this thing is is chugging away, and uh, we're actually going to see see the data that we're getting shortly, I think. Hmm, maybe, maybe. All right, I'll tell you what. Well, ah, well there we go. Oh, uh, right. I'm just impatient. Let's pull it back up. Sorry. <laughs> Give me one moment. I think we're pulling a lot of data down. I, uh, that's uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so we have a moment. Um, but while this is loading a second time, should we see the real-time visualization again? That's yeah. always fun as well. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. So, so over here, I actually have two: the real-time data coming from our device right here. And so you guys can see that that the box on the screen is moving. Well, this box is moving because I'm moving. Some of you watched our previous session, and you already know this. But this box is moving on screen because I'm moving this device. That data from the device is being processed partially on the device and partially on Azure because we move the data up to Azure. Azure does a little bit of processing in that function app. And then we actually store it in our table, which is what we're about to show. Now, it turns out that while IoT Hub and table storage are, are great, IoT Hub really is the one great for volume, great for security. There are some limitations, being it being a queue-based system. So it's a queue-based system means it's not quite real time. And so for this visualization right here that you guys see on screen, where I can make my little cube dance around, for that, we actually do take a different route. We actually kind of kind of Y our branch, our data. And so part of our data actually goes, instead of going through our function app and table storage chain, it hits our ASP.NET web app directly with signal r so we also ping our asp.net web app that has signal r set up and then signal r will rebroadcast rebroadcast that message to any interested clients okay so you're basically bypassing all the cool stuff in azure well, why did we do all that work? <laughs> well, we did all that work because obviously we have historical reporting here. Everything with SignalR is ephemeral. That data gets broadcast out. It's real time. We can have real time clients see that data, but it's not being processed or stored. Right. It's not go. It's it's gone as soon as as the clients receive it. So it's ephemeral. It's not reliable. So right. we're 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 handling two different situations in the way that's most appropriate. Right. And so that full pipeline again is is means historical data. It means that we can. We can query for, for device, and it means that we can expose it in several different ways. So it's very common for businesses to have a website to actually do visualization. We didn't show that today, but it would be very, it could do some graphing and charting and data analysis right there on the website, as well as consume it for mobile clients. So that, that web app gives you a lot of flexibility. Exactly. We can do a lot of different things. And, and just like the web app has a lot of flexibility, again, so does Azure. So we're going to handle certain things in, in different ways, depending on what our needs are. So we had two distinct needs. We need to do some data processing and some analysis on our historical data. We want to see trend lines. And we want to also maybe apply some machine learning to this data. However, we also wanted to see a real-time visualization so we could see what's going on right now. Two different requirements. 
we handled with two different branches. Fantastic. So let's actually see how we set up Signal R. So we already had our, our web app. And so since we already had this web app, all I did is add the Signal R NuGet package to my ASP.NET website, by the way. Added our ASP.NET uh, NuGet package and then added this app map signal R to my startup class. So in other words, as soon as the app domain loads for ASP.NET for this project, it's going to say, all right, map signal R. All this does is go looking for signal R hubs and register those with our, with our routing engine, with our ASP.NET routing engine. So if you, if you try to access the slash signal R endpoint, it's going to find our hub, and now, so I, and yeah. this, this responds to requests, so it's not running continuously. It's waiting for that request. That's right. This is an endpoint. So this is an endpoint on ASP.NET. So it's, it's waiting for something to hit it. And so when something hits it, what it does then is it adds it to, to this, to this, this. well, it doesn't even really add it to anything, to be perfectly honest, because it immediately just looks for anyone who's interested in hearing this message. So we hit that hub. The hub says, is anyone listening? And I actually have our, our apps, our, our mobile apps and our, and our UWP app set up to register themselves to listen to only specific devices. For instance, in, in your app, when you click on in the list view on one of those named devices, right. we have the ability to do that same visualization we just saw. And so it's going to show the device that you clicked on. Now, the version that you guys have seen on my laptop just is hard-coded to that machine sitting next to me. But we register to listen on a certain device. So our, our, our clients hit this endpoint here, say listen on device. And so once those client apps listen on the on, for that device, then when that device pings our startup, our signal, our hub here, then well, what we have is our device data received. That's actually where the device pings us, hits our hub, is device data received. And then you can see we actually go and we broadcast for a given device. Uh, actually, we have, our, we have our send for a given device, our clients.group. So this group says, all right, I'm going to broadcast anyone listening for this device. Now, I do this every time. Each of my devices, when it sends data, is going to ping signal R, and we're going to say clients group device, and send, we're, we're sending device data. Now, if there's nobody in that group, in other words, nobody's listening for this device, that data is thrown away, gone forever. Once again, it's just ephemeral. Even if we do send it to some client, the client just displays it real time and then throws it away. So this is all, all just for, for real time. It's not storage, it's not reliable, it's not guaranteed in any way, shape, or form. But incredibly powerful that we can potentially, in near real time, right. get status information or visualizations from our devices in the field. Exactly, for our real time needs, this is pretty amazing. It's just not appropriate for our, for our analytics or reporting or long term storage. For that, we have, it looks like your, uh, your app is yeah, now Yeah, I think showing. we're up and running, so we can switch back to my machine here. It's great. I think my, my development machine is, is getting a little tired. Uh, but here's our Xamarin Forms client, and this is running on UBP, and again, for simplicity of deployment. And again, all live web data, and, and what I love about this stuff is we can, we can consume the data in various ways. We've got a list view showing our sellers and data. We've got a graph. This is pulled in as a third-party NuGet package. Uh, makes this really easy to write, you know, fairly interesting and responsive uh, pieces of UI. Yeah, that's amazing. Now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try the real time, and I'm gonna have to let the cat the bag here says so I'm thinking it's a little bit delicate at the moment, so I'm gonna hit the uh, the real time. And this is actually is connected, uh, I believe, to is this connected to device right now, or is this is the? I'm not sure. We might have left that one on the uh, on the sample data, so it might just uh, be okay. running. That one might be running. It looks like it is because we're not moving the device. Ah, so perfect. We have, so we, you, we've already seen the live real time. But of course, demo, yes. So, so no. we've seen it on mine. We don't. We don't need to prove it. All right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and again, the great thing is all of this code, really everything except for the function app, which of course is tucked away in Azure. <laughs> uh, but actually, I'll pull it down to GitHub. But all the code we're demoing today is going to all be on. It's all on our GitHub. Uh, we'll show you that uh, link in just a moment. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and actually, you didn't even mention about function apps. I believe we now do have support in Visual Studio. So, so if you don't particularly love the idea of, of doing your development in the portal um, and relying on that NuGet package being pulled down every time, then you can actually develop now in Visual Studio your functions. Absolutely, you can. And compile them so that your NuGet package is there with it all the time, and so that the, the startup speed, that startup cost that you talked about, yeah. if you had a lot of NuGet packages, so you don't have to pay that cost. Absolutely, so really, really quite powerful. Again, exactly, pre-compiled, uh, hopefully faster a little time. 
And, and it, it, it leaves you open to other things too, like developing locally uh, and even deploying through VSTS as well. So again, really integrating all those amazing tools we have. Um, yeah, it, it's fantastic technology. I, I can't wait to write more functions. Yeah, I mean, so guys, we've seen, what, like five or six Azure tools today, and we've seen it do some amazing things. Like I said, there's actually just thousands and thousands. I don't know if that's literally true, but there is so many <laughs> Azure tools. It definitely tools. feels like it sometimes. I think yeah. it may actually be we, true, we, to we be perfectly honest. We're, I think we're on our way. Yeah. Right. There, there are a ton no. of Azure tools, and all of them are built to work together, to yeah. fit together nicely. So so it's a lot of fun experimenting with them and, yeah. and learning how we can we can build amazing tools. Yeah. Um, just the function app alone, how we would have had to have handled that before, standing up our own separate server, running some code that was listening on a queue in a loop. I mean, man, that's a lot of work compared to the magic that he just pulled off. Well, so, and wow. what was great here is, I mean, we didn't new up all these pieces, but really the IoT Hub didn't require much more work than what you saw today. The Function App, writing a bit of C-sharp code. Table storage, we knew it up. We write to it from Function App. So a lot of this can actually be deployed very quickly. And if you've got ASP.NET web skills, yeah, it's that, that pretty endpoint goes pretty fast as it's well. It's pretty crazy. Uh, so what we really wanted to get across today is that, well, one, there's a lot of fun, amazing, cool technologies you can play with in Azure, but also give some insights into why we chose these technologies and, and kind of how they fit within with each other, and also well, within Xamarin as well. We had a lot of fun. And, and, I, and I, the last thing I want to say here is, I think it's clear, but I love that we've got Xamarin on both ends right, here. Right, we've got Xamarin on both ends, yeah. feeding Azure, yeah. Azure having an incredibly cool pipeline yeah. working with the data, and then Xamarin consuming the data, yeah. Absolutely. Really, really cool, Xamarin and Azure. Right, love just it. fantastic, and, and yeah. And the other message is, Xamarin's more than just phones, right? It's more than just mobile. It's, it's, it's it really, is, your, it is yeah. your, your, your rich client yeah. tool of choice, yeah. It's it, rich client, so whether it's, whether, whether it's a, a, a IoT type device, whether it is a mobile device, whether it's a desktop, um, it's, it's there. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, well, I had a great time. Me too. It turns uh, out this is actually our last .NET yeah. Comp session. Wow. And I think this is the end of day for .NET Comp too. I, so. I think it is. Yeah. So, so, so we did it. <laughs> All so. of us, not just not just Adrian and I, but the <laughs> but the entire .NET Comp. Yeah. Uh, Pulled it off. So this is pretty fun. Yeah, I can't wait to, to go off and watch some of those. Uh, those I know some of the missed. other yeah. sessions that we <laughs> that we weren't able to watch. So this was a, right. an amazing conference. So what we did manage to catch was amazing, and uh, I think we didn't do too bad. No, I had a great time here. Excellent. So if you're hungry for more, uh, I've got a number of links here. Now, of course, again, our source code aka.ms/netconfzamu. Source code for uh, it's all the same repo for all of our sessions. So you get the IoT code. The, the mobile client, the, even the web API, it's all in there. Lots of great fun stuff. Um, a bunch of documentation. Obviously, Bing is your friend. Uh, you can search for these kind of things. IoT Hub, Function Apps. The, there's really, really great, fantastic samples out there. Uh, can get you up and running. Um, and to go out there, have, have a great time and build amazing things in the cloud. Yeah, and if you're wondering where you can learn more about Azure or Xamarin, uh, oh, right. that's well, a good maybe, maybe university.xamarin.com <laughs> would be a good destination for you. Remember, there is a ton of free content yeah. there. And then there's the option to go into live classes where you can interact yeah. with me and my fellow instructors, and we have a lot of fun teaching you guys how to do really cool stuff like we've done today. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely check it out, university.xamarin.com. All right, guys, thank you very much. As we said, it's been an yeah. absolute blast doing all these .NET Comp sessions with you. Look forward <laughs> to doing it again. Thank Bye you very much. Now. Take care.